case one, Heike Ganroku, or the Blue Cliff Record. This case is titled, The Highest Meaning of the Holy Truths. First, the introduction to the case. When you see smoke on the other side of a mountain, you already know there's a fire. When you see horns on the other side of a fence, you already know there's an ox there. To understand three when one is raised, to judge precisely at a glance, this is the everyday food and drink of patch-robed monks. Getting to where he cuts off the myriad streams, he is free to arise in the east and sink in the west, to go against or to go with in any and all directions, free to give or to take away. But say, at just such a time, whose actions are these? Look into Secho's trailing vines. And the main case. Emperor Wu of Liang asked Master Bodhidharma, what is the highest meaning of the holy truths? Bodhidharma replied, empty, without holiness. The emperor said, who is standing before me? Bodhidharma replied, I don't know. The emperor did not understand. After this, Bodhidharma crossed the Yangtze River and went into the country of Wei. Later, the emperor asked Master Zhe about this. Master Zhe said, your majesty, do you know who this man is? The emperor said, I don't know. Master Zhe said, he is Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva transmitting the Buddha mind seal. The emperor felt regretful. He wanted to send an emissary to fetch Bodhidharma back. Master Chur said, Your Majesty, do not say you will send someone to fetch Bodhidharma back. Even if everyone in the whole country went to go get him, he still would not return. So this case, or koan, as we call them in the Zen tradition, is the first one in the collection, as I mentioned, uh, known as the Blue Cliff Record. It contains 100 such koan, or public cases, we call them. Public because they're for everyone to examine and to consider. And in our school, uh, koans become objects of meditation for which we develop responses that we check uh, with a teacher about. To practice with koans is much more than an intellectual exercise. We do use the intellect um, in, in this practice, but we also have to have some kind of experiential insight into the koan before a teacher will tell us that we have passed that koan and can go on. So in this particular case, um, we have uh, an introduction, which is often called the pointer, and then the main case, and then some commentary by uh, a master named Yuan Wu, uh, 12th century. So, we should go through the introduction um, with uh, a little bit of care and then we'll treat the main case. Again, the pointer says, when you see smoke on the other side of a mountain, you already know there's a fire. And we have an expression like this in English, where there's smoke, there's fire. You don't need to see the fire, you just know it's there. When you see horns on the other side of a fence, right away, you know there's an ox there. What else would have horns? <laughs> to understand three when one is raised, to judge precisely at a glance, this is the everyday food and drink of a patch-robed monk. 
So a patch-robed monk is an epithet for Zen priests because they're because the robe originally, like in the Buddha's day, was created by stitching together small scraps of cloth. Um, the everyday food and drink that Yuan Wu is telling us about here is the ability to judge things precisely at a glance. You don't need an overabundance of information. You just can tell. One of the things that we cultivate as a result of koan practice is the ability to act with spontaneity in our lives, to, to do the right thing in the moment without having to debate internally with ourselves or externally with other people. Nothing wrong with discussing things, but we just know what the right thing is because with sufficient practice, we tear away some of the, what we call the vines and entanglements that keep us pinned down. It allows us a certain level of freedom because we're no longer confused about the meaning of our own lives. And so it says, getting to where he cuts off the myriad streams, myriad streams of discursive thought, if you will, he is free to arise in the east and sink in the west, obviously like the sun. So this is a very powerful thing, but also a very natural thing. So being spontaneous is not being reckless. It is being completely natural and in accordance with one's particular circumstances. And free to give or to take away. Sometimes this phrase uh, is amplified uh, by saying, free to give life and to take it away. And it ends, but say, at just such a time, whose actions are these? That is to say, who is it? Who is that free? And I ask you, watching this video now, are you that free? As free? As the sun? And the main case. Emperor Wu of Liang asked the great master Bodhidharma, what is the highest meaning of the holy truths? So we should probably explain who these people are. First of all, Emperor Wu was famous for um, supporting Buddhism in China uh, at a very early date. Um, he was uh, apparently referred to sometimes as the Buddha Heart Emperor. So he was a political leader, but he was also um, someone with a pretty, pretty keen spiritual interest. And Bodhidharma, sometimes in Japanese tradition, he's referred to as Daruma, but Bodhidharma was uh, 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 from India, and he had, according to legend, traveled to China in order to spread Buddhism there, and is considered in the Zen tradition to be the first Zen ancestor, the progenitor of Zen in China. So a very significant person. Um, in more antiquated language, we sometimes refer to him uh, as the, the first Zen patriarch. So Emperor Wu of Liang asked this master, Bodhidharma, what is the highest meaning of the holy truths? And Bodhidharma replies, empty, without holiness. Well, <laughs> this was not the answer that Emperor Wu was expecting. It was well known that one uh, doctrine of Buddhism has to do with these two truths, two holy truths, let's say. And I talk about these two truths all the time. So there is ordinary truth, something we sometimes refer to as the relative truth, 
and another kind of truth that we might call the real or the absolute truth. So everybody in the world has a good grasp of ordinary truth. Ordinary truth, ordinary understanding of reality is that things are as they appear to be. The stick is a stick and my name is Gendo and the Buddha is the Buddha. Uh, a flower is a flower. Um, you have your own name and your own identity. Um, it's not the same as my own. Um, the stick is not a rock, it's not a tree, it's not a fish, and it's not a bicycle. All of these things are distinct and separate, have their own kinds of identities, at least from the perspective of ordinary or relative, sometimes we say dualistic, truth. The other kind of truth is not something that most human beings are even remotely aware of or they might be dimly aware of it, but usually don't recognize it as something that they might be able to cultivate and that it would have a transformative power in their lives. This uh, absolute truth has to do with emptiness. So <clears throat> when we talk about the absolute, what we're really talking about is the absence of an inherent and lasting essential nature so that the things of this world lack a kind of own being or they lack a kind of inherent essence that governs what it is they are or what we perceive them to be. Uh, the Sanskrit word for this is shunya, lacking, and we translate it into English as emptiness, but you should not think of emptiness in this context as being just a, like a simple vacuum or a void. It's not like that. It just simply means that things lack an inherent and enduring essential nature. So the stick, for example, is, made of wood, I could, I could break it into little pieces of wood, <laughs> little shavings of wood, and I could break down each of the pieces into ever smaller pieces until I get down to molecules and then atoms and then even the particles that comprise atoms. And nowhere in the stick will I find an essential stick nature that makes this object a stick. We call it a stick by convention. Your teacup could be broken into pieces and those pieces into ever smaller pieces and so on. And nowhere within that teacup will you find the essence of a teacup. There's nothing to be found there. So this is uh, maybe a, a, an explanation uh, of what we mean by emptiness. Now, with these two truths, the relative and the absolute, the emperor is asking, what is the highest meaning of these holy truths? Well, there's a doctrinal answer for that. And the doctrinal answer is the two truths are not two. And we see this in things like the Heart Sutra, which we chant every day. It says, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is exactly emptiness, emptiness exactly form. They are identical. It's just that we can look at them from two perspectives. Their identity is what allows us to say, that the two truths are not two. So the emperor is probably expecting to hear Bodhidharma confirm this. And so in a sense, the emperor is testing Bodhidharma, which is a bit ridiculous because the emperor is pretty much uh, 
a novice and kind of green. He feels devotion, but has not had any real insight of his own. Nothing in the way of uh, an experiential insight. He has a philosophical and a doctrinal understanding of the Dharma teaching, but that's the limit of it. And what he gets as an answer is the meaning of the two truths is they're empty. And they're not holy. There is no holiness, which sounds rather sacrilegious on Bodhidharma's part. So the emperor, not quite understanding where this, uh, where this uh, answer is coming from, questions Bodhidharma a little further and says, who is facing me? In other words, who are you? You know, what are, what are your credentials? You know, where are you coming from? Who are you? And Bodhidharma replies, I don't know. And then the case goes on. The emperor did not understand. No, he did not understand. He did not understand Bodhidharma's phrase, I don't know. After this, Bodhidharma crossed the Yangtze River and entered the kingdom of Wei. Now, what's sad about this <laughs> emperor is that unlike the suggestion in the pointer where three corners come up when one is lifted, this emperor does not get it. Bodhidharma's first answer was perfectly clear. The second answer was superfluous. And yet, Bodhidharma is being very compassionate and really opening up his heart to the emperor, trying to help this blind political leader understand. but the emperor did not understand. You see, he's made a mistake. And unfortunately, that mistake had repercussions for the emperor's life. And those repercussions went on for the rest of his life. And he never was able, really, apparently, to come to any real understanding of Bodhidharma's words. Now there is a backstory to this. So in, this, in the main case, the emperor has asked Bodhidharma two questions, but there was actually a little exchange before those two. The first question that the emperor asked Bodhidharma was, it was like a, kind of a statement and then a question. He said, um, I have built temples around the country and I have given orders to ordain monks and nuns I have been supporting the Buddha Dharma for years. What merit has been accumulated as a result of my actions? And Bodhidharma replied, no merit. And then the emperor pursues things with uh, some doctrinal stuff about the two holy truths. Well, you can see what the emperor is really all about here. You know, he has been doing some good things, and he apparently really did do some good things for the Buddha Dharma in ancient China. But what he wants to know about it is, what's it going to get me? What is the merit? He means, what is the karmic merit in my actions? And Bodhidharma throws dirty water on him. No merit. Well, that's a pretty cheeky response to give to a Chinese emperor. Now, this particular emperor was a bit of an exception. He actually outlawed capital punishment. But most other emperors, if you crossed them, and you might not even know you were doing it, they would have you executed just like that, sometimes after torturing you. And sometimes the method of execution was itself the torture, like death by a thousand cuts. This emperor had the power to do it. He didn't do it. 
In fact, if you look at it, Bodhidharma's answers to all three questions were pretty cheeky. We're basically denying the emperor any kind of affirmation of what he already thinks is true. How did Bodhidharma get away with this? He was basically a nobody from India, a country the ancient Chinese thought of as a, a land of barbarians. Well, the difference was, is this, it's exactly in the pointer. Bodhidharma was the kind of person who could tell precisely at a glance what situation he was in. Can you? He could see that the emperor was hungry for something, that the emperor wanted the truth and really was quite helpless in the face of this desperate desire. And Bodhidharma, on the other hand, was free to give it and take it away. In other words, Bodhidharma had all the power and he knew it from the get-go. So when this audience was over, and the emperor did not understand, Bodhidharma went somewhere else. What he did was he went to Shaolin and sat in meditation for the next nine years. Nine years facing the wall of a cave. He did not come back and the emperor never understood their exchange. Now, if you want to understand this case, you have to then take on the next character who is Master Zhe. Uh, Master Zhe is a priest that the emperor respected. Um, so emperors uh, quite often would hire uh, a master to be their guiding teacher in the Buddha Dharma. And so Master Ju is that is that person. And so the emperor is still kind of bothered after Bodhidharma leaves. You know, this idea won't leave him alone, that there's no merit in his good works, that the highest meaning of the holy truth is empty, no meaning. And that the person who was saying these things didn't know who he was. <laughs> so he brings it up to Master Zhe. And Master Zhe asked, does your majesty know who this man is? And the emperor said, I don't know. And this is pretty interesting because those are the same three words that Bodhidharma used when asked who is standing before me. Bodhidharma said, I don't know. Master Chu asks the emperor, who was that man? And the emperor says, I don't know. So, are these two statements, I don't know, the same? Or are they different? When Bodhidharma said, I don't know who I am, and the emperor said, I don't know who he is, are these two I don't knows the same? Or are they different? Can you tell at a glance? If you say they're the same, you're as deaf as the emperor. And if you say that they're different, then the Buddha mind seal will never be transmitted. So how do you respond? So the emperor says, I don't know who that was. Master Jaya said, he is the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. So this is a figure I may need to explain as well. So Avalokiteshvara is, uh, let's say, the, the Indian form of um, Kanzayan or the Bodhisattva of compassion, a very deeply enlightened being whose emphasis is all about compassion. And here we have to be very clear about the meaning of compassion. It does not mean pity. So very often when we see other people suffering, 
it evokes a feeling in us. Um, and uh, we, we might say, we might say, I just pity that person so much. Well, one of the first things that I was taught as a Zen student was to beware when that feeling of pity arises because if you have this feeling of pity, if you have this feeling that someone is worse off than you, you are elevating yourself and probably on false grounds because whatever suffering you see out there it is your suffering. And I can mean that in multiple ways. What we want to do instead of pity, which creates a division between self and other, is to cultivate compassion. Compassion, come is a prefix meaning with passion, suffering. So we suffer with that person suffers, I suffer. You cry, I cry. You get hurt, I hurt. It's one suffering. Because when we have that feeling of compassion, it's impossible to divide yourself from that person. And it's impossible to judge them because you yourself cannot escape the same kind of suffering. You can put this to the test immediately. The next time somebody makes a decision or behaves in a way that makes you judge them, instead of judging them, look into yourself and see when have I made similar, let's say, mistakes, or I've just made similar decisions or behaved in the same way? And when you see what you yourself have done, you say, oh, well, I did that because I was afraid. Oh, I was afraid. They're afraid. Oh, I understand them. So you see, a lot of people will judge somebody like, um, like a president <laughs> um, because he seems to be uh, uninformed and to speak, make statements that are just blatantly untrue. But why? Have you ever done that? People don't tell the truth when they're afraid of the consequences of the truth. And so you can only imagine the sheer terror of a person who habitually is dishonest. But rather than judging them and hating them for it, we can have compassion. It liberates us and with practice, it liberates them too. So this Avalokiteshvara is the enlightened being of compassion. Avalokiteshvara is the one who hears the cries of the world and weeps. Wants to help. Sometimes has many arms and many faces. So as to be able to see everywhere and to reach everyone and to bring them the salvation of the Buddha Dharma. And so Master Ji tells the emperor that Bodhidharma is Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, transmitting the Buddha mind seal. Well, what is the Buddha mind seal? The Buddha mind seal is uh, uh, an epithet for transmission, Dharma transmission. So you can imagine like a, a Chinese style seal, a uh, stone seal that's got a carving on the end of it and you put ink on the end of it and then it gets stamped onto the paper. And that contact, what printers would call a, the kiss, <laughs> there's no separation between 
the stamp and the paper. This is the Buddha Dharma mind seal. And so when the teacher transmits the Dharma to their student, we say that's the, that's the Buddha mind seal right there. Well, this would be a terrible thing to have missed. <laughs> the, the transmission of the Dharma from one human to another human is a very special occasion. I can tell you, <laughs> mine happened in the middle of the night by candlelight. It's uh, traditionally a secret ceremony and is revealed later, like the next day, that it has taken place for reasons that I have gone into in other talks and may again later. But, but the point is, it is not something you want to miss if you have the opportunity to receive it. And yet the emperor has made a mistake that has cost him the transmission of the mind seal. The case says the emperor felt regretful. Well, yeah. So he wanted to send an emissary to go invite Bodhidharma to return. Oh God, I gotta get him back. I have to get him back. So desperate is he to have something that he can hang his hat on. But Master Zhe is no slouch. He knows what's going on here exactly and says, your majesty, don't say that you will send someone to fetch him back. Just don't even go there. Don't say that. You're just setting yourself up for increased disappointment and more suffering said, even if everyone in the whole country were to go after him, he still would not return. So when you're first reading this case, you wonder, how can that be true? You know, this is the emperor. He has armies at his beck and call. He can send a whole battalion after Bodhidharma and catch him and tie him up and bring him back to the palace, whether Bodhidharma wants to come or not. But Master Ju is saying, even if everybody in the country let alone a battalion, even if everyone in the whole country were to go after him, he still would not return. Why not? How can that be? How can one human being, Bodhidharma, have that much power, that much independence? You see, we can make mistakes and miss things and never be able to recover. Now you can make up some mistakes, perhaps, maybe, but some of them are irrecoverable. You know, don't miss your opportunities. I want to point out something about the pointer and the emperor. The pointer talks about how a Zen adept will see three when one is raised. It's like lifting up a cloth napkin. I can lift it by one corner, but the other three come with it because it's all connected. It's all interdependent. And in the case of this exchange with the emperor, he asks, Bodhidharma, three questions. But the original question, which is unspoken, would have pulled all of this up anyway, if he had just asked it, but he didn't. He's so caught up in self-clinging, in his delusions about himself, that he doesn't even know what is the first corner to lift up so that the other three are obvious at a glance. What is that original question? Well, there's so much in this case to consider that I'll just tell you. The question is, who am I? What is the meaning of my life? And it's very simple. Now, Bodhidharma knows that that's the root question and why? 
because it's everybody's root question, everybody, without exception, whether they know it or not. So Bodhidharma's answers are all the same. They are all an answer to this root question, who am I? What is the meaning of my life? And unfortunately, the emperor did not understand. In fact, um, he went on living in darkness <laughs> until Bodhidharma, who, as I said, went on to Shaolin, died. Bodhidharma uh, was uh, practicing Zazen in a cave. But he also debated with other masters uh, of his time, and he beat them. <laughs> you know, he, he had actual experiential understanding as opposed to just book learning. Nothing wrong with book learning, but you have to have the Buddha's experience to know what those books are really all about. And... Bodhidharma made it perfectly clear that he knew and they did not and they became enraged and they tried to poison him many times. And he foiled their assassination attempts repeatedly until finally um, he did transmit the Dharma to one of his students. And that's an interesting story and becomes a koan all by itself. But um, after that, there was, a, a, according to some stories, a sixth attempt to kill him by poisoning him and he just let it happen. He just let them kill him. Because he had done what he came to do, which was to transmit the Buddha mind seal. And he did it. Now, sometimes I wonder what Bodhidharma must have felt He could tell that the emperor really was hungry for something, really had raised the Bodhi mind and wanted to know the truth of his own life and tried to give him the truth over and over. But he didn't hear it. And this is something, a point that I want to emphasize. A teacher will tell you what the truth is. They make no bones about it. They're not hiding it. It may seem very mysterious and hard to understand, but they're not hiding it. One time when I was in graduate school, I, I took uh, a course in Buddhism. And the professor of this course, um, who was not, he was not a, a Zen practitioner, but he, he knew something about Zen a little bit. And he said, Zen masters notoriously never say what they mean. Well, I knew enough even back then to know that that's not true. And I can tell you as a teacher right now, that's definitely not true. A teacher always says exactly what they mean. They mean exactly, precisely what they say. But we don't hear it. I can also tell you that my very first koan, it wasn't this one, it was another one. The teacher just outright told me what the answer was, <laughs> but I didn't hear it. It just goes right over your head because you're so busy watching the film of me. Most of us, you see, listen with ears that really don't function as ears. So I ask you, do you have ears to hear? Or are you like the emperor with ears that only talk? In other words, are you thinking about what you want to say when somebody else is telling you something? And then in my case, months later working on this koan, I did finally break through. And I was passed on the koan. And it was then, it was like, how could I have been so stupid as to not have heard the answer when it was spoken to me? 
well, you can see that might have a lot of compassion for this emperor. And now a lot of compassion for teachers like Bodhidharma, <laughs> who try and try and try and try. So one of the points of this koan you see is that Bodhidharma's answer, the first answer, the very first answer, was repeated a second time and then repeated a third time. Nobody does that, except maybe Bodhidharma. And we say of such teachers that they have grandmotherly kindness. They'll do anything for you. Because it's really the only way any of us ever get through our conditioning. It's the only way any of us ever awaken is that a teacher felt compassion for us because they too could not hear the truth. And once we realize how hard our teachers were working to help us, it's just like, oh, I don't, I don't, first of all, know how I could have been so dense as to have missed it again and again. And yet had a teacher who was my safety net in a way. And she couldn't do it for me, my teacher, Myoyu Roshi, but she was always there for me, always. And she still is. And I cannot begin to repay the debt of gratitude. Yuan Wu makes this comment in the case about that feeling of gratitude that eventually comes when we realize how much we've been helped. He said, you could crush all of the bones in your body as a demonstration of your willing sacrifice, a symbol of your gratitude and it would not begin to requite the debt. Oh, I know that feeling. A lot of people want to be wise and compassionate. They want to become teachers and share the Buddha Dharma. It's hard to do. but it's a laudable goal. You just have to know going in that most people are not going to hear you. And more than that, people will not even begin to listen to you. But I want to imagine that that's not you. I want to imagine that you have ears for hearing, that you can break through the iron wall. Because if you do, if you can hear, then you can make Bodhidharma come back. And not only come back, but you can make Bodhidharma come back from the dead right now. Right now. You can make him come back from the dead and enter the Emerald Palace and transmit the Buddha mind seal. All in an instant, if you can really uncover what he had to say. So please don't waste your life. Don't waste your opportunity for practice. Look deep into the highest meaning of the holy truths. Retrieve 
Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva from wherever he is. Thank you for listening.